I'm sorry. I'm, on behalf of the co-presidents of the society, Rosalind Dixon and Lorenzo Cassini, I would like to welcome you to our first ICONES book panel discussion. For this first panel, we picked the book entitled Constituent Power and the Law, authored by Joel Colon Rios and recently, recently published by Oxford University Press. The book examines a set of historically grounded and theoretically rich concepts that seeks to connect the idea of the constituent power with the way the law, and more specifically constitutional law, engage with it. The book includes uh, rich case studies not sufficiently elaborated previously by the literature and examines the ideas of authors that are often neglected by the English language scholarship on the idea of constituent power. Um, we believe that there's much to learn from the discussions uh, that are included in, in, in Joel's book um, and the ways to justify and show how the imperative mandate, for example, uh, operates is a, is a very useful thing to, to, to read. Uh, the book offers a very compelling and timely and informed analysis of the subject, and we believe that is the perfect candidate for to initiate our ICODES book panels. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Liz Hicks, who will introduce uh, the panelists and the author in a moment and will explain the methodology of this panel. Uh, Liz Hicks is a PhD candidate, uh, jointly supervised by, by the Melbourne Law School and Humboldt University of Berlin. She specializes in the area of comparative constitutional law and theory and holds an LLM in German and European law from Humboldt University and an arts and law degrees from Monash University, where she is currently a teaching associate. Liz? Thanks so much for this introduction, Sergio. Um, just a brief comment on housekeeping today before we begin. I'll introduce each of the panelists in turn, who will each have five to eight minutes to comment. So I'd just like to um, remind the panelists that we'll keep quite strictly to time so that we have enough time for Q&A at the end. I'll also give um, panelists a friendly reminder um, once you reach the eight minute mark. Joelle will then have 10 minutes to respond to the panelists' comments before we begin the Q&A. For participants, you can ask questions of the panelists or make comments in two ways. So by this point in the year, I'm sure you're all very familiar with Zoom. Um, so there's a ask uh, raise hand function at the bottom of your screen or also in the chat panel. Alternatively, you can write your question or comment in the chat panel. If it's directed toward a particular panelist, please also note that. Um, just to let participants also know this panel is being recorded but the Q&A at the end of the panel will not be recorded so as not to deter more adventurous comments and questions. We'd also like to encourage participants to turn their video on because uh, the recording will be in speak of you. So we won't see you unless you're speaking. Um, but if you aren't speaking to so please place your microphone on mute. So our first speaker is Professor Sandy Levinson from the University of um, Texas at Austin. Well, first of all, thank you very, very much for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here and to talk about a really, really terrific book. Um, let me say at the outset that one of the really embarrassing things about the book and one of the things that makes it so worthwhile for me is it's introducing me to an array of thinkers, in many cases, quite frankly, I've never heard of and have not read, obviously. I think of Ron Herschel's uh, continuing insistence that we move beyond the usual suspects with regard to the study of comparative law. This book brought home for me the need to do that with regard to the usual suspects with regard to the topic of constituent power. Uh, the introductory chapters on Siez and Rousseau, and then later discussion of Carl Schmitt, are all superb, but less surprising. I had, in fact, heard of these people and, in fact, have read them. And, you know, I, I can say that I learned from Professor Colon Rios's analysis, but it was not revelatory in the way that most of the book is truly revelatory when it talks particularly about Spanish and Latin American and Italian theorists of the constitution. Partly what I'm doing is reflecting the awful parochialism of the American Legal Academy in terms of my being 
a monolingual English speaker and reader, and the fact that those foreign sources I'm familiar with do tend to come from a relatively short list of usual suspects. So this is really one of the wonderful, wonderful contributions of the book. Uh, quite frankly, I'd never heard before of Constantino Mortati, and he strikes me as an incredibly interesting thinker. And I wish that he had been translated into English. Like one of the practical problems is that many of the people you discuss are not available in English. Um, and I truly regret that. One of the things that struck me about the people who are discussed is the frequency with which they are active participants in constitutional battles, writing new constitutions, displacing old constitutions. I'm sure that some of the people you write about could be described as armchair academics, but more of them seem to be, although perhaps academics, also important as active participants. And that led me to wonder if there's a real difference between active participants and more detached academics. So for example, the beginning discussion of Rousseau and Siez, Rousseau for our purposes could be viewed as an armchair, not academic, but at least an armchair theorist who is in essence fantasizing about possible futures. For better or worse, we have no idea what he would have done in 1789. But we do know what C.S. was arguing in 1789 in the thick of a battle where he had to try to assemble coalitions within the assembly and whatever counted for relevant public opinion. And I really do wonder if this is distinctive about much of the literature about constituent power, um, that it is a peculiarly activist form of theory, um, as opposed, say, to the endless debates, particularly in the United States among academics, about theories of constitutional interpretation. This has nothing to do with constitutional interpretation. Rather, it is all about who writes the foundational constitution. I should say that my interest in this topic derives from my obsession over the last several years with the general topic of popular sovereignty um, and the, how popular sovereignty inevitably will raise all sorts of questions for the notion of constituent power two of which, of course, are central. The first question is who in the world counts as the people? And I think part of the helpful discussion in the book is the distinction between people as aggregations of individuals, methodological individualism, and people as members of a nation. But of course, the second question, whatever your definition of the people is who gets to speak for the people? Um, is it Lenin? Is it the people in Philadelphia? Is it people who gather in Madrid or in Lima or whatever? Um, and this I think is the unending mystery of the whole notions of popular sovereignty and constituent power that they are essentially contested concepts, to put it mildly. But here, it's not merely trying to win an academic contest, but also trying to win a political contest where people claim to be the instantiation of a generalized people or nation, whereas obviously most people had no role in picking the um, those who speak for them or in the specific decisions. So I will end as a parochial American and point out that within American political thought, there is a 
stunning paucity of serious discussion, not only of the general notion of popular sovereignty, but particularly of constituent power. The closest there is, I think, to a canonical argument about constituent power in the US Constitution is Federalist Number 40, which is almost never taught, never discussed, but it's extraordinarily interesting in which James Madison tries to present the notables who met in Philadelphia as instantiating we the people and authorized basically disregard the existing constitution that is the Arts Confederation. He also makes an appeal at the end to say, look, we're not imposing the constitution. This is only a set of suggestions and it will get the approbation of the public. But part of what's so interesting in your book is that it makes a real difference whether the public is some notion of a popular referendum where everybody gets to vote or a much more indirect process, which is certainly true of the US Constitution process of ratification. I'm at eight minutes and I will stop. A wonderful book. Uh, thanks, Sandy. So now we'll hear from Associate Professor Zorana Klopchik from Carleton University. Uh, unmute. <laughs> I think you need to unmute yourself, Soran. Oh, okay. I am yeah. unmuted. Can you hear yeah. me? Okay. So the frequency of the mentions of constituent power, the word constituent power over the last 200 years, basically negligent until second half of the 20th century, and then sharply spiking um, in the 90s and 2000s. So the first question that I'd ask, the main question that I'd ask is, why are we talking about it? We can afford not to talk about constituent power, not to write books about constituent power. Constitutional scholars for the last 200 years almost have done perfectly well without mentioning constituent power or even the people. So for example, Pennox and Chapman's um, constitutionalism makes no mention of the people or constituent power. Constitutionalism and transformation, 1996. You know, when I was doing my master's, this, this was the go-to book. Mentions constituent power once, Preuss mentions this uh, in the context of territorial uh, dissolution of multinational federations in Eastern Europe. So there are reasons why we talk about it. And these reasons, you know, have to do something with our expectations. And those expectations are not the expectations of scholars. And this kind of goes back to what Sandy has said, what, what, what Sandy mentioned a, a bit earlier. These are the expectations of citizens. And there is an irony here at play that, you know, our discipline, the canon of our discipline is basically comprised of pamphlets. I don't know whether there is another discipline that, you know, divines the meanings of contingent, practical, pointed, in, intentional interventions in political debates. And then, you know, we are those who talk about these questions um, in a detached way. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm lazy or maybe it's a matter of temperament, but I don't have questions from the perspective of scholar. From the scholarly perspective, Joel's book is phenomenal and fantastic. And, you know, it just makes me jealous. I wish I was able to, to write in such a wonderful, thorough, composed and clear way. Well, you know, um, obviously, you know, I, I, I try to compensate this um, with, with some other interventions. So I'll, 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 I'll keep along uh, uh, this line. And what I'd like to focus on in the, in the remaining part of my, my um, intervention is on, not specifically on the concrete political expectations that we may have at this point in time, but on the things that we may be neglecting as we are focusing on the questions of constituent power, but we, which we may not want to be neglecting on, you know, in hindsight on, on further inspection. Um, and in that regard, what I think is important to notice um, is the simplicity of Joel's um, title. It's deceptive in its, in its unassuming title, Con constituent power and what else? The law. Not even constitutional law, the law. So 
for me, it's interesting because usually when you think about it, the way in which we theorize constituent power is always as part of some sort of binary, right? So there is constituent power and constitutional form, constituent power and constituted power, constituent power and demanding powers. And in each of those cases, we think that we gain something, God knows what, um, but what we do also at the same time is conceal certain issues that in hindsight, again, I'm not sure that should have been concealed. So for example, constituent power and constitutional form allegedly creates this generative paradox that is a condition of, of juridical knowledge. What it does, it conceals the territorial container of a pre-existing state. And with it, it conceals the constellation of external powers, which at some point in the past have created that state. So, you know, the divination of the ontological meaning of constituent power hides certain very, very down to earth practical issues. Constituent power and constituted powers. Um, every mi minute spent on talking about constituent power is a minute not spent talking about the nature of constituted powers. So when you read New Deal, American constitutional lawyers, it's, you find references to private power. And, you know, maybe I'm wrong, so I'll be corrected. Almost in the sense of treating the, the expression private power as a category of constitutional discourse, at least an analytical category. Did we do that? By the way, another diagram. This is, these are the references to private power, the red one, and the snail here, the blue one, is constituent power. Constituent power goes up, discussion about private power goes down. Did that serve us well? Again, question as an armchair amateur constitutional theorist slash citizen. And finally, um, constituent power and amendment powers, which I think is maybe the most important from Joel's perspective because it touches most directly um, the juridical character of, consti of, of constituent power. So in that context, what we gain, apparently, what is dignified is the idea that constituent power um, can be used to um, affect major constitutional changes, fundamental constitutional changes. What is being reaffirmed at the same time, and you will correct me if I'm wrong, what is not being problematized is, is the question of what's fundamental, what's constituent. And in that sense, Joel's book is actually really, really good. And this is one of its subtle achievements. That is one of the rare books. And aside from the question of the material that it brings to the fore, it's one of the rare books that begins to take the question of constitutional categories, not concepts, categories, broader categories, Seriously. So when we talk about constituent power, what kind of power is it? Is it appropriate to talk about constituting? Are we really constituting constitutions? Um, what is fundamental? So um, the reason why I'm asking these questions and the reason why I'm drawing attention to these um, adjectives is because I wanna push Joel on his final ultimate expectations from this project, he obviously says at the end of the, the, the book that there is a lot of work to be done. And then, you know, hopefully one, one hopes um, that at the end of that work, once, once that work is completed, then, at, you know, ideally certain things would happen and we would begin to look at, at the, the problem of constitution making in a different light. And to me, that presupposes that there is something in, Joel's argument, and I mean, the argument of all of us that is capable of pers persuading those who would otherwise remain unpersuaded. And in that regard, I'm not sure that I'm persuaded because I'm not sure that those who would be opposed otherwise to Joel's project or his broader project, which is, you know, more, more radical democratic and more critical of the, you know, mainstream traditional liberal constitutionalism, that they would, that they would, um, that they would be shaken, that they would be upset, that they would be uh, become doubtful about their own commitment to um, 
to inherited constitutional categories once we showed different ways in which um, constituent power as a juridical concept can be exercised. At the bottom, and this is my last sentence, um, the distinction between theory and law, between ontology and law, is itself kind of, it dis dis dissolves once you look at it at a finer grain, because what's, what's juridical becomes theoretical and what's theoretical becomes juridical. So we can't, I'm not sure whether we can escape these practical, engaged, existential issues. And in the world of, world of today, in which our democracies are degrading and dissolving before our eyes, I'm not even sure that we should. So um, not a scholarly question, obviously, um, but a question that tries to kind of smoke out Joel, not so much on his political engaged commitments, but on his expectations of and from his theory in real world. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so now we'll hear from Dr. Mariana Velasco Rivera from the University of Göttingen. Thank you, Liz. Hi, everyone. Um, so first of all, it's an honor for me to, to be here um, uh, and be able to talk about Joel's, Joel's book and to share this panel with uh, these wonderful people. And also like, thank you all for, for, for being here. I have three comments I want to make. Um, the first one is, of course, like to praise the book. The second one is uh, something I chose that I find really insightful about um, specifically chapter eight of Joel's book. And the third one is a question re regarding the scope of Joel's theory. So first the praise. Um, so we often um, hear that, you know, the concept of constituent power, power is a slippery one, one that it's hard to grasp because of, you know, the political and sociological nature of, of the concept. Um, it is also often disregarded as, as some, like as a concept that has nothing to do with the law, um, but rather something that you would know it's there when you see it. Uh, so in this, in this sense, it's like understood as something like as a supernatural force. Uh, but in this book, uh, what Joel responds to this idea is basically say, like he says, basically, no. I mean, actually, I'm going to show you how this conventional approach and the understanding and this understanding is not sufficient uh, to grasp, like to fully grasp uh, constituent power because constitutional theory uh, by only or overly uh, focusing in the political and, and extra legal features of constituent power uh, has disregarded uh, and failed to understand its juridical nature. Um, so what I'm going to do, Joel says, is I'm going to show you that constituent power indeed has a, ju a juridical nature. Um, and he delivers. I think he delivers wonderfully. I think uh, it's really well written and it's brilliantly executed. Uh, in a way, I think that what Joel is doing is uh, basically demystifying uh, the concept of constituent power. And he exp splendidly explains how this idea has traveled throughout, you know, like has been traveled and, and has been understood throughout, throughout history, how constitutional theorists uh, as well as political actors have understood uh, the concept. And also like he illustrate how the concept has been used and the legal effects that this concept like has created in the real world. Um, and on top of that, on, in, like in doing so, he systematically and clearly maps the different iteration, iterations of the concept. So in my view, like the, like I think the an enormous valuable like feature of the book is this like pedagogical um, feature, you know, like when you finish reading it, or at least when I finish reading it, was like, I, I really felt that my understanding of the concept was actually like sharpened. Um, so, and I think that this is, this is all due to Joel's ability or like Joel's conceptual clarity. So in short, I think you should like, I think this, is, this book is a must and everyone should buy it. <laughs> but yeah, so, and then now, 
Uh, my second point is, um, is about what I found uh, insightful in chapter eight, uh, when Joel explains the notion of the material constitution and, and, the rela and its relation with the constituent power. I found this chapter extremely insightful in, um, in that it shows the importance of the, of the extra legal dimension of constituent power to justify imposing limits on the amendment power. Especially uh, the way he does this is by, you know, like by contrasting those theorists like who, who accompany the idea of the material constitution with an extra legal constituent subject like Schmidt and those who don't like Gelsen. And somehow this contrast is very illuminating and left me thinking about how important it is to get the theory right and how deeply circumstantial it is to have courts that are actually like, you know, willing to impose uh, substantive limits to the amendment power, like, you know, Colombia or India and others who are not just not, not willing to do it, like in Mexico. Uh, because like, even though courts may not explicitly say they are adopting, you know, one or the other theory, these ideas uh, and their iterations and their misunderstandings actually travel and maybe tracked uh, in judicial decisions. So my question in this regard is if this is something that you, Joel, uh, were thinking about when writing this chapter, because it somehow reads as like an underlying concern, but if it is, I just wonder why you did, you did not like say it explicitly. And lastly, I don't know how am I doing with the time, but lastly, um, <laughs> okay. So lastly, uh, my comment is regarding the scope of, of Joel's theory, uh, specifically what exactly can be understood as the exercise of constituent power and what cannot be understood as such. Because across the group, across the book, sorry, I got the impression that sometimes Joel is suggesting that uh, constituent power is only exercised when there is a change to the material constitution in constitution making instances. For example, in chapter four, when you are like when you are discussing the material constitution, but it's especially in chapter ten when you are discussing uh, constitu the, the constitutional and constituent uh, referendum. Somewhere at the beginning of the chapter, you say, and I'm quoting, there are not there are not many situations in which flesh and blood human beings that live in a constitutional order assume a real juridical presence. However, I wonder and would like to ask you if your theory has space, you know, for other less immediate ways to exercise it ways that could potentially entail, entail important and deep transformations without necessarily entailing the adoption of a new constitution, but that due to the nature of such transformations could be understood as the exercise of constituent power. This idea is similar to actually to Sandy's and Jack Balkin's theory of partisan entrenchment, which like mainly posits, posits that fundamental and revolutionary constitutional change happens through most often through ordinary institutional means. So on that note, I'm thinking about, for example, the exercise uh, of the right to vote. Because for me, it is hard to imagine a better example than the right to vote to illustrate flesh and blood, and blood like flesh and blood human beings assuming a juridical presence with enormous potential to bring about fundamental transformation in a constitutional order, perhaps even more so uh, than the very adoption of a new constitution. I am thinking about, for example, the election of presidents like, you know, FDR in the US or Mexico. Yes, I'm going to say it, presidential election in, the, in 2018, uh, or even the election of Joe Biden. Um, I, I mean, we could, we could say like we can treat Mexico and, and, and the US right now as question marks because we still remain to see the fundamental change, but still the question remains. Um, so, so yeah, I have an additional example about South Africa, but like in, in interest of time, I will just like end here. And the question is, you know, just to sum up, the question is if your theory allows space for understanding this as mediated exercises of constituent power. That's all, thank you. Thanks so much, Mariana. Um, so now we'll hear from Associate Professor Sabrina Ragone of the University of Bologna. 
Thank you. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here, not only because the work that we are discussing today has brought me back to the classics, not only because it clearly shows how much constitutional theory and comparative law, which is my main field, are deeply intertwined, but, but also because this is probably one of the best ways to spend an evening of this half uh, intermediate, whatever we want to call it, lockdown that we are experiencing uh, in Italy. What can I say? It was a pleasure to read the book. It is well written, it's ambitious, it's brave, and I truly think that it represents a successful attempt to explain why old, early formulations of very traditional concepts still apply in today's scholarship, or still inform today's scholarship, and how we can read and reinterpret traditional theories through modern categories. Actually, this conflict and dialogue between ancient and modern, between the past and the present, is there throughout the book. Sometimes it's addressed directly, sometimes it is between the lines, but I, uh, it's clear that times matter in many senses within this piece. First, because some of the ideas were established when there were no rigid constitutions, as the author shows clearly, no clauses on constitutional amendments. Second, because the origins and exercise of the original constituent power can affect the legitimacy of the corresponding constitution over time, so much later. And last but not least, because in many theoretical constructions, the constituent power has to be a limited phenomenon in terms of length and always precede the constitutional order with which it cannot coexist. So I will briefly, very briefly address four points that hopefully will foster further discussion later in the debate. No diagrams from my side. The first point relates to democracy and its place within the theoretical construction of the book. The second point concerns the conservative dimension of the constituent power. The third one refers to the role of constitutional design in this construction. And the fourth one, very, very, very quick on the importance of the context. So let's start with democracy. Reading the book, one gets the impression that the third element of the equation, or maybe the trinity of the, uh, of the title of the book that was already uh, addressed, so constituent power, the law, so the, the third element would be sovereignty, especially in the last two chapters. But also the amending power clearly is a leading character in the story that Joel wants to tell us, maybe to a lesser extent at some point democracy. And with respect in particular to, to direct democracy, as it was mentioned in a couple of comments before, and its connection to sovereignty and constituent power, I think that that point could be uh, addressed uh, uh, again in further detail in the discussion. Second, second aspect, the conservative dimension of constituent power. Leaving aside the cases mentioned in the text in which dictators have used the notion to justify departures from the constitutional order, which probably amount to abusive constitutionalism, the book also shows that constituent power can be invoked not as a revolutionary uh, force, but as a conservative force, very rarely to restore a previous regime, but also much more often when it's used to stop an amendment when it is used as a limit to political power to strike down a constitutional amendment. And on this, I will, I will come back in one minute. Third point, a few words on the role of constitutional design with respect to the topic. I am thinking about the sections of the, of the book on formal and material constitutions and eternity clauses at the intersection of these two approaches. Uh, Joel says that they made these clauses made explicit the material content of a constitution, a content that was outside the scope of demanding power. This raises the question of how the, this approach relates to those constructions which create a hierarchy among constitutional norms through what, what is called the supraconstitutionality dogma. Additionally, I wonder to what extent constitutional design can truly come into play with respect to these issues, because one of the findings of my comparative research on constitutional adjudication on amendments was exactly that the presence of eternity clauses did not truly make a difference, as constitutional courts actually define the scope of the limits to the amending power in any case, with or without eternity clauses. So recalling what Zoran asked before, what's fundamental is almost always decided by, by courts. Furthermore, constitutional design can become relevant also with respect to the so-called total amendments. 
those instruments will, which let constituent power be exercised within constitutional orders. But then again, the debate on total reforms, on total amendments, and the struggles in scholarship and case law to establish in any way implicit limits, even with respect to total reforms, show us that either international law or the principles of constitutionalism sometimes, probably not natural law anymore, can be used and have been used as limits to the amending power, however named, or even as limits to the constituent power. Fourth and last point, the crucial role of context. From a comparative perspective, constitutional and political culture, traditions, impact on the conception of sovereignty and the material constitution, and therefore also on the idea of constituent power. And I wonder to what extent this element dilutes the possibility of establishing comprehensive categories. Also in this respect, to conclude, I think that this book provides insights that future studies on different understandings of constitutionalism beyond the ones that are addressed in the book will have to take into account. Great. So, thanks so much, Sabrina. So now from, we'll hear from Associate Professor Sergio Verdugo from the Universidad de Desarrollo. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, so first of all, I, I would like to thank Joel for a really wonderful, wonderful book. Um, he takes his time to discuss uh, the most important authors that he uh, discusses in the book, and, and, th and that I really appreciate. I, I I really appreciated also the way uh, he treats the Rousseau. Uh, so I wanted to ask two questions that are related to uh, Rousseau, uh, two points. One uh, regarding uh, the compatibility of uh, the way he reads Rousseau's theory with uh, modern theories of, um, of uh, constitutional theory. And second, about the, direct, the way the direct mandate can be concretized. So for Joel, um, if I read him correctly, uh, using Rousseau's approach to the constituent power and the law involves first uh, assuming that um, the literature that uh, says that Rousseau connects his ideas with direct democracy is wrong, or wrong mostly in, 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 many, in many cases, right? Uh, so Joel uh, revises the, um, the considerations for the government of Poland, among other works, to suggest that uh, Rousseau tried to solve the practical difficulties of uh, having large assemblies especially in, uh, in, in larger states. And he suggests one of the solutions that he suggests is to use a representative body, right? So representation was super important for Rousseau. But Rousseau never really concretized that much the way the direct mandate was supposed to work within these representative um, institutions. Uh, but these representative institutions in itself is a rejection of direct democracy. So this is the first point. The second point is that uh, the constituent power then needs to take a legal form, and that legal form is pre-established. So Rousseau actually thinks that the constituent power is not extra legal, right? Uh, and this is his main difference with uh, CES. And third, that all this involves collapsing the distinction between the original and derived uh, constituent powers, right? Because of the juridical nation of the constituent power. So all of these points are made in the book, and I think they're, they're compelling, and I think they're very interesting. Um, but they pose a challenge, right? Um, because if we take this uh, theory uh, and we, we, we try to make it, um, to apply it to contemporary uh, doctrines, it will be hard to justify any normative theory that relies on a multi-stage approach to claim for a juridically dependent power on the first level, the original power to justify the role of judges. So I'm thinking of, for example, uh, Janif's theory on the unconstitutional constitutional amendment doctrine, which relies on the original um, uh, constituent power and maybe even Ackerman's theory of constitutional moments uh, to justify usual review, right? These two theories are just examples of theories that rely on a first stage of the original constituent power that seem to be incompatible with the way um, you phrase uh, Rousseau's theory. Um, so, uh, and this is important because uh, the way judges have built on these multi-level theories, uh, especially in the, in the countries that, that you cite, I know the Latin American cases more than the others, um, which you also explain in your book, they typically assume and even demand the identification of this extra legal and superior power of the people and of the nation, right? Um, and Therefore, they seem to be more connected with the ideas of C.S. and Schmidt, right, uh, rather than the ideas of Rousseau. 
And before reading your book, I was always thought that Rousseau's defense of popular sovereignty could be compatible with this. Uh, but in the way you read this, um, uh, it seems that is not. So after reading your book, um, I, my view, I, I realized that my view of Rousseau was a simplification. I, and I wonder if there is anything in your revisionist approach to Rousseau that can be used to make these theories consistent uh, with his approach. So the second point that I wanted to make has to do with the way um, the imperative mandate can work, right? So um, Rousseau never really explained this that much, right? But you elaborate on this a lot. Um, so my main question is how to identify the will of the people for elaborating imperative mandate instruments nowadays, right? You say that there's a lot of work to be done in this, but I want to push you with things that maybe you, um, you enunciated your book, but you don't... Um, but you enunciate them as a, as a, as a long-term agenda as well. Um, so uh, chapter 10, especially, you, you, you say that you use the idea of the referendum as a way to include uh, the idea of direct mandates, right? Um, but this can pose some challenges uh, like in, 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 constitu in, in contemporary constitution making process. And I'm of course influenced by the, by the, by the problems that I'm seeing in the constitution making process of Chile. So people can vote yes in a referendum, but understand divergent mandates. Should we give any weight to the people that did not vote yes? Uh, people can have different reasons also to vote yes, and some may think that a specific procedure included in the mandate is necessary. Others may not even know what specific procedures are. Uh, they are just approving a general mandate to replace the constitution, but not necessarily all the rules that are included. So I think that the example of Chile is useful uh, because in the Chilean, in the October referendum of uh, October 25, right, uh, last, uh, last month, uh, the people uh, approved the constitution making process and empowered the constitutional convention to make a new constitution. There were two questions, right? Um, the, whether they, they approve the new constitution or the constitution making process and whether they approve a constitutional convention or not. And there was an 80% of Chileans that voted yes to both, uh, to both uh, ideas. Um, but there are a lot of pending things that have not been regulated yet because the uh, political elites have not yet agreed uh, on all the parts of the process. So the, the parts of the process that uh, were uh, subjected to a vote were kind of incomplete. Uh, so we may expect some changes in the way the procedure is going to be regulated before the Constitutional Convention starts to operate. There are changes in the, um, there, there, there's probably going to be changes uh, in, in lowering the barrier cost for independence for example, and there's probably going to be an addition of including reserved seats for indigenous people. You could say, for example, that people that voted in favor uh, of, that was, that is in favor of uh, assigning reserved seats for indigenous peoples in the convention voted yes, but with the expectation of that change. But you could also argue that some people uh, was against the reserved seats and they voted yes because the procedure did not include them. Right, so there's no clear uh, identification of what is the will, uh, and then there's also the the question of the supermajority. So there, there's a legislator that's now trying to lower the supermajority rules of the constitutional convention. So you could argue that the people that voted yes in the in the plebiscite was in favor of simple majority rule and voted yes despite the existence of supermajority rules, or you could argue that they are in favor of that they were in favor of supermajorities in the first place and they voted yes because they feel that they are in a minority and they voted yes because the supermajority rules were giving them certain sort of guarantees. So if you are going to enforce some sort of direct mandate from the people, how do you do that, right? In this complicated uh, scenario, are the constraints included in the referendum part of the mandate? If yes, then the constitution making process should not be amended maybe. Uh, um, so what do we do with reserved seats? Are they gonna be illegitimate if they are gonna be approved? Uh, these are just some, um, some questions that I, that I placed, but thank you very much for this uh, really, really uh, important book. Thanks for the comments, Sergio. So now we'll hear from, uh, finally, Associate Professor Yanni Rosnai from RDC. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, I would like first to thank Mariana for inviting me uh, to this important and celebratory event. So when I heard we have eight minutes to speak, I have to admit I panicked. Uh, what am I gonna say in the next six minutes after I sing the praise on this book? And this is indeed 
a terrific book. It has theory, comparative insights, history. It is Joel's magnum opus. Now, Claude Klein once wrote that the concept of constituent power is one of the most abstract concepts in constitutional theory. And that is why perhaps so many scholars have been fascinated by it. Well, it is still a challenging concept. I mean, who is the holder of constituent power in Hong Kong? Or in Cyprus, created by a multinational treaty? Or in South Africa's interim constitution in the mid 90s? Was it the political actors drafting the famous three agreed upon 34 principles? Or the constituent assembly? Or was it actually the court in its certification case? Constituent power is still uh, an abstract concept. But thanks to Joel's work, uh, uh, it is less abstract. Joel is taking us one step forward in grasping this uh, uh, elusive concept. Now, Joel's book is an encyclopedia of constituent power. Uh, everyone are there. Of course, Kelsen, Schmidt, Yeyes, Lawson, Locke, Rousseau. But its strength is the analysis of the non-usual suspects. Orio, Heller, Mortati, Pinzon, Concha, Durani Bass, and many more others. In fact, I think that my only critical remark is that when reading the book, you often can't see the wood from the trees. There's just so many things in there. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing. It only implies that this is a book that one needs to read seriously more than once. And just to please my favorite uh, publishers, should also be purchased by each reader more than once. Now, the complexity of the concept of constituent power, I think was well articulated by a Parisian law professor Julien Odut in, in 1856. Odut wrote that sometimes it is a powerful and, and, and forcible dictator that imposes its will upon the governed. Sometimes it is the beginning of a revolution. Uh, uh, and basically, Odut summarizes his argument on constituent power. He, asked, he says, the proper answer for the question, what is constituent power is, whatever you want it to be, dear reader. Is it? It is here, I think, that I found Joel's contribution extremely useful. Joel convincingly explains why constituent power is not whatever you want it to be. It is distinguished from sovereignty. The two, although very often confused, are not identical. So Joel writes that constituent power is the power uh, to create novel constitutional orders. And it is in that respect, not bound by positive law, but the exercise of constituent power will always be based on and limited by a commission so unlike a true sovereign, an entity authorized to exercise constituent power cannot transform any will into law, but only to produce constitution law. And this is an inherent limitation. Now to this limitation, I want to add one suggestion of my own. The very concept of constituent power may carry other certain inherent limitations by the fact that the basis of the theory of constituent power is the power of the people to create and recreate their constitutional order. Now, in order to protect the very idea of constituent power, in order for constituent power to be exercised in the future and to allow and facilitate the people's exercise of constituent power, certain rights which form the basis of constituent power must always be protected. In other words, the exercise of constituent power cannot result in the abolition of rights such as freedom of expression or assembly or political rights, which are necessary in order for constituent power to reappear in the future. The exercise of constituent power must maintain its capacity to rethink and, uh, and, and, and reshape the cultural order as a whole. Uh, moreover, I think that the exercise of constituent power must be consistent with the idea of the people. An exercise of constituent power that results in the alienation of groups uh, of the society uh, undermines the very raison d'etre of constituent power. If the people or some parts thereof are excluded from the polity, and are no longer able to exercise constituent power, this should influence the legitimacy of the constitution making process. One cannot use constituent power in order to undermine the very notion of constituent power. Now, this limitation is one of legitimacy, of course, not of legality. So to conclude, the constituent authority may be many things Richard Kay writes in his famous article on constituent authority, but it is not anything we want it to be. In a recent conference I attended that was held in Oviedo, uh, Ignacio Guterres argued that constituent power cannot do anything it wishes. It needs to create a constitution. Can we, he asked at the conference, by exercising constituent power, 
select the song to the Eurovision? I think that in his book, Joel provides a strong response. No, constituent power only involves a constitution-making authority. It is not, as one French scholar claimed in a conference in Boston five years ago, the sheer exercise of power like a bank robbery with a gun. It is a juridical act, a special type of act with a special juridical test. Thank you. Thank you, Yaniv. So now we will hear from our author, Professor Joel Colombios from the Victoria University of Wellington, who will have 10 minutes to respond to the panelists' comments. I think, I think you need to unmute. Yes, now? Yes? Thanks very much, um, Liz. So I, I just wanted to say first um, how grateful I am for um, to all the panelists for having read so closely the book and for this um, wonderful and and exaggeratedly positive um, comments. I, I, I really appreciate um, the, the time that you spent um, reading the book and, and just these wonderful comments you have give, given me. Um, I also thank um, Liz for, for um, kindly accepting to share the panel and also Fred, Sergio and, and Mariana for the organization, especially to, to Mariana, who, who I think was the, kind of the mastermind behind the, the event. Um, and now, now, Liz, my 10 minutes, they, they start counting from now, yes? <laughs> yes. Um, yes, no, so, 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 so what, what I'll try to, I mean, these are so many comments and so many interesting questions. So I, I'm just afraid that everyone will be disappointed because I won't be able to, to address them all, not only because of the time, but because they are very good questions and, and, and I would probably need much more time to think about them. So, I, but, but I, what I'll try to do is to kind of say something and respond as best as I can to some of the comments that were made. Um, and I will do it in, in order. Um, so, um, Sandy, thanks very much for those um, wonderful comments. Um, I'm a huge admirer of your work, and it's really a, a, an honor to 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 hear what you had to say about about the book. I think I think um, the, that first point you made about um, the differences between what you call an armchair theorist or academic or philosopher and a sort of academic slash politician is a is it, an interesting um, distinction, and perhaps. An example of that distinction is Rousseau itself, because Rousseau, as you said, he, he could be described, uh, described as an armchair philosopher, um, but that's mostly, say, the Rousseau of the social contract. But then when he engaged in more kind of practical writings, like his writings on Poland and Corsica, um, the, the the institutional proposals he makes are some that, that consistent with with what he says in the social contract, but he seems to make all sorts of compromises and qualifications. Um, so I think that there's an interesting distinction there, and, and it's a distinction that, as, as you say, is perhaps very obvious in many of the authors I discuss in the book, because these were authors writing about constituent power, but also authors who sometimes sat in constitution-making bodies, authors who were sometimes even um, high officials in their um, countries. Oh. Um, there's a question as well about how, um, if, is there something special or different about the theory of constituent power um, in terms of its relationship with this more practical, um, um, the, the, just the practice of, practice of constitutional law. And I think um, it may, may have to do with the fact that the, when a constitution is made or when something that is described as an exercise of constituent power takes place, uh, because it in some way takes place outside of the established rules of change, um, theory becomes more important. So, so in a constituent assembly, for example, when people, um, delegates to a constituent assembly try to understand the nature of the power they have, they cannot do that by referencing um, a, a previous law. They usually do that by referencing um, works of constitutional theory, um, which perhaps is part of the reason why we don't see so many mentions of the concept of constituent power, say, in US constitutional um, discourse. 
um, and history, perhaps because there, you know, after the constitution was adopted in the right, at the end of the 19th, 18th century, there hasn't been many other constitution making episodes as opposed as as in the countries that I discuss in the book, um, so Spain, France, and so on. Which brings me, brings, brings me to the point, um, one of the points made by Soran, which is just the the, the increase in the 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 frequency of the of, of the of appearances of the concept of constituent power in in constitutional um, theory as compared to say you know after as Soran says after the beginning of second I mean in the 21st century mentions of the term constituent power started to appear and and it's it's something that I, I don't know if, if if you have noticed but if you read for example um, books written in English about the French Revolution or about CS for example when they when, when the word that that is being translated is constituent power, sometimes um, American and English authors, they translated constituent power just as popular sovereignty, because I think um, otherwise no one would understand what they were talking about, say, in the 1960s or, or 70s. And even in when Kashmir's book was translated in in um, 2008, I think every time Schmidt says Verfassungsgewende Gewalt, it was translated as constitution making power, not as constituent power, as opposed, for example, to translations of Smith in, in Spanish, which use the term constituent um, power. Um, so why why is it not why is that why is it that that it has not been traditionally present in 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 some in some leaders right I don't know it, it may have to do with the fact that that constituent power is kind of a of a of a, a sort of a radical implication it's sort of a reminder that that there is some li uh, some extra legal power that is always there irritating and threatening the constitutional order and perhaps from a certain point of view it doesn't really make sense to talk about constituent power in a in a legal um, context but um, I think nowadays and this has probably has to do I think with the with the growth of co comparative constitutional law as a discipline once all these authors from different from continental Europe and Latin America start writing and um, papers and and that are there that are then read in the US and, and in the in the UK, then I think the concept just became part of the of, the, of our normal voc or just the, the mainstream con comparative constitutional law vocabulary. Um, yeah, th that question about what is what is um, fundamental, I think that's that's a question that yeah, that's that's sort of that question in in a certain way. One thing that I I, I try to show throughout the book is that. Um, there has there's always been some kind of consensus so, so about what kind of things count as fundamental. So if you look, for example, at the, at the writings of conservative proponents of the historical constitution in, in, in the 19th century in Spain and, uh, and, uh, and in France to a certain extent, you always see that the same kind of things that then end up in eternity clauses are identified as sort of what is the fundamental content of the um, constitution. Um, so Mariana raised two very, um, very interesting questions as well. I think um, I'm probably running out of time now. So I, I think I'll focus on the on the second one. Um, so, so, and the question was, so what counts as an exercise of constituent power and, and as Mariana said um, very correctly in the in the book I sort of suggest that constituent power is only exercised when there is a change in the material content of the constitution um, whatever that material content is so I think part of the answer to that question is that um, you know the, the answer depends on what we understand to be the material and um, constitution but then Marianne has a further question which is which is yes but but um does that mean that constituent power can be that that we can understand that for example uh, an election in which people vote for different candidates in say say for president or for um for um you know um, for parliament and so on can, can an election have the nature of a constituent act and and the answer may be yes, maybe yes, in the sense that um, 
sometimes, and Mariana gave some examples, an election sort of inaugurates a period of important change. And that change perhaps can be described as material constitutional um, change. And in, in this way, there's something I, I, I wrote in my, in my previous book, Weak Constitutionalism, which I distinguished between, between the initiation of, of an exercise of constituent power and the implementation of the decisions of the constituent subjects. So, so, so the initiation of an exercise of constituent power can take place, for example, in the streets. So for example, in the case of Chile, we saw the popular protests that, that now have, have led to a formal constituent process, but I wouldn't say that the for that the exercise of constituent power just be, begins once the constitution begins to be written, but it probably began with those um, popular protests. So in the same way, those um, you know, an election could take the place of those protests and end up in the production of material constitutional changes. But I think that to the extent that constituent power is about the creation of new constitutional norms, it must involve some kind, in the end, it must be directed to some kind of constitutional change. Um, Sergio, I think, I mean, the, the, you raised really, really interesting and, and, and difficult um, questions, um, but um, Liz, can I ask you, how am I, am I doing on, on time? Um, so just a couple more minutes, I think you still have. I think so, so, um, so Sergio, what, what, so, so the point you raised about Rousseau, so um, if I understand Rousseau, as, and I think you, you, you you actually describe this um, perfectly. So, as as in, so, so 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 I say, if you read Rousseau properly, then the conclusion would be that the distinction between the original and the derived constituent power um, collapses because um, constituent power can, in fact, and should, in fact, be understood as being susceptible of being exercised through law. Um, now, that that um, way in which you explain it, which I think it, it's correct, assumes that, or, or comes accompanied with the assumption that the exercise of the original constituent power must in some way be illegal, that it must in some way happen um, in violation of established law. And, and I think that that I perhaps would take exception or kind of qualify that in a, in a, in a certain way because if that's true, then one would probably never find an exercise of original constituent power because even in cases like, for example, in Colombia and, and Venezuela, where the established rules of constitutional change were not followed when the constitution was adopted, the constitution making process took place in accordance with, with the law in the sense that there was a law passed that con that called for a referendum and then that law established what would happen if the referendum if, if there was a positive vote in a referendum and uh, and so on, um, so that's that's one one um, just small qualification, which is even if we accept the distinction between the original and the derived constituent power, the exercise of the original constituent power, I think, does not even in the traditional view, I think we have made a mistake in associating it with with just sheer illegality, but then. Is my conception of Rousseau consistent, say, with Janif's um, theory of the limits of um, the amending power, um, which relies on some kind of original extra legal constituent power that is outside of the legal outside of the legal order and that acts as a limit to the power of um, constitutional reform? And I think the answer is yes, because um, what say Rousseau would say, I mean, the Rousseau that I, the way I understand him would be to say, if, if he was speaking about the limits of constitutional um, reform, reform, he would say something like, well, um, the, the provisions contained in a constitution that authorize constitutional amendments are not, um, do not involve the exercise of um, constituent power by the people because the constituent power um, that the people can exercise, even though it should be institu institutionalized so that, that it can be exercised in accordance to legal procedures, have to involve some kind of um, participatory process that goes beyond, for example, what most constitution establish as the rule of change, which require just like two thirds majority in, in Congress, for example. So if a two thirds majority of a legislature attempted to fundamentally change the constitution, Rousseau could still say, no, that, that um, 
constitutional amendment is unconstitutional because if you want to do that, you have to use another procedure that should be established by law, which allows for a more participatory process of constitutional change, such as, for example, a constituent assembly and so on and so forth. Um, now, um, I'm sure I'm, I passed the 10 minutes, but I'm just, just a couple of minutes just to... to um, sure. Um, um, Sabrina, yes, you raised very, very interesting um, points as well, and, and and I have to think more about some of the things um, you you said. I think I, I mean I agree with your 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 point about democracy. I didn't talk much about say much about democracy in in in, in, in that book. I have a, my other book, um, weak constitutionalism, is really about the relationship between um, constituent power and and um, democracy. But of course, in the discussion between um, or the distinction I tried to um, develop about popular and national sovereignty in the in the book, the idea of democracy is just there. It's just that it's, it's not so explicit as you say. But but um, but but in a way, that discussion is about democracy, about how a democratic constitutional order should understand um, the exercise of political power, and this. Um, actually brings me to, to, to the point, final point made by, by Yanif, and I completely agree with what Yanif said, that in addition to distinguish between constituent power and sovereignty, and the implications of that distinction being that because the entity that exercises constituent power is not the sovereign, it cannot do anything at once. It can, it can only produce constitutional law. I think Yanif, Yanif is, is right to say that, that that doesn't mean that within the jurisdiction to produce constitutional law, the constituent power can legitimately do anything it wants, because if it engages in the production of constitutional forms that um, make impossible its future exercise, it would be acting contrary to the very idea of constituent power. So I, I fully agree with, with Yanif on that, on that point. So I think I should I should probably stop. Um, I mean, I talk about yes, I responded to everyone in some way, right? Yeah. So Yanif, yeah. So um, no, and thanks again, everyone. I mean, I'm, I'm, I will think I, I made lots of notes, and I will um, probably have to write volume two uh, in order to to reply to probably reply to all your all your thoughtful comments. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Joel, and we're um, looking forward to both volume two and the Zoom discussion that will follow. Um, so now turning to Q&A, just again a reminder of the